Bam! Joy here. Hi, I'm Liz. And today, um... Actually, we're talking about something serious! Yeah, we are talking about something very serious. It's always serious. And I'm gonna start off, um, just with a little bit of an intro. Wait, so we're talking about today... Oh, yeah. I think we'll start by talking about the media's ap apparent discovery of a birtherism plot against Kamala Harris... As a Democratic presidential candidate, which I personally does, I don't believe exists because I'm a part of the movement that is being blamed for these birtherism claims. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit and then we're going to get into a discussion about reparations because that's the main topic of today, reparations for American descendants of slavery, ADOS. And then, yeah, that's what we're going to talk about today for the most part. Yeah, and I really wanted us to do this video um, because I think that folks, including myself, need to be a little bit more educated about this topic. Um, we need to know who ADOS are and um, what the story is. And so um, this is going to be kind of like an intro video. Um, and then we're going to hopefully talk about it more. Do it more as we get our damn reparations. I wanted to talk really briefly about um, who I am, because I feel like that is going to I want to talk about my role in this video. Okay. I feel like your role is clearer than my role. Why? Because I'm black and I'm AWS? Yes. Okay. So Because like, I can speak on it? Yeah. Okay. And That's I'm cool. not speaking from my lived experience as a black person living in America. I'm not even American. I'm also the child of an immigrant mother to Australia who's from Hong Kong. So, I mean, I just wanted to talk briefly about that and, you know, I was first introduced to reparations um, in grad school. I read the... Um, did we read that as a part? Did you read yeah, that as part of a class? Yeah, in oh. advanced policy analysis. So not until oh, yeah. the second year of our okay. two-year program. Um, I read The Case for Reparations by Tana Hasi Coates, which is now five years old. And there's been plenty, It's five years old? Yeah. Wow. And there's been plenty of movement since hmm. then. Um, so at a basic level, you should have read that already. Yeah. Um, it's. I mean, it's in, our day, in 2019, the... Mm -hmm. The uh, foundation, good or bad, for the discussion on reparations in America, mainstream media has been Tony Hasi Coates' yeah. uh, article in New York Times, a case for reparations. So I'll just say no, that. No, it's from the Atlantic. Is it from the Atlantic? Yes. Okay, my bad, my okay. bad. So, my bad. Um, yeah, and I guess my brief opening comments are just that, like, I am Joy's partner, and I see a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. You know. At, being experienced by the You're person. You're a witness to it. Yeah, by the person that I love and have chosen to spend my life with. And, um, you know, the things that we're going to talk about, it's not just a data point. Um, yeah. It's not just a graph where ADOS are here and um, other immigrant populations uh, are up here and white people are up there. It's like her other, life. Not even other immigrant populations. Because well, I wouldn't say ADOS, we're not immigrants no, for sure. No, I'm sorry. That was a... It's what I'm saying, but I think it's clear to make that distinction that people will, you'll hear the terms forced migration or, um, yeah, forced migration is the latest one I've heard. Or, no, that's not the case for people who were, black people, African people who were enslaved yeah. as a part of the transatlantic slave trade. I know, but I, I, I just want to yes, make that, that distinction. I misspoke. I want to make that distinction that no, African right. descendants of, sla American descendants of slavery, American descendants of slavery are not forced migrants, we're not no. resettled workers. Mm -hmm. We were enslaved by the transatlantic slave trade. Yes, great In, clarification, yeah. okay. thank you. So my last couple of points are that like, um, ADOS are not down here on the chart because of a lack of hard work or um, not pulling themselves up by their bootstraps because you were hitting the tripod. I know, I Because I <laughs> see her working super hard um, well, every day, you. working harder than me. Um, and just a really big point that has has stayed in my mind for such a long time from um, Coates' article was that um, black families, was the stark difference between the neighborhoods that black families live in and I see, uh, compared to white families, and I see that with you, that like, Black families who earn a hundred thousand. I mean, I don't live in a ghetto, but go ahead. No, but, no, it's not a ghetto. But black families who earn a hundred thousand dollars are living in neighborhoods where white families are earning thirty thousand dollars. That's crazy. And That's the, a really crazy difference. And that black people who pull themselves out of um, poverty or um, who were low income earners and then pulled themselves 
up to the middle class or even upper middle class um, then see their children and grandchildren slip back down and that is a unique um, facet of life uh, for black people foundational black Americans in this country so with that being said yeah I mean we're like I said we're gonna start our conversation talking about after the last debate there became this big discussion in the media about Kamala Kamala Kamala, Kamala. Harris's blackness and uh, a, a new birtherism movement similar to that which was waged against uh, former President Barack Obama by mostly Donald Trump. There, there, there was this new birtherism movement against Kamala Harris. And it just kind of ticked me off because I know that at least the folks they were trying to blame for this new birtherism movement, Black, ADOS, American descendants of slavery, were not, tr there was no birtherism whatsoever. Um, that this, we never question Kamala's blackness, that instead we're really advocating for a black agenda for each presidential candidate. And that if you're going to mask yourself or try to appeal to the black audience, oh, I went to Howard, oh, I'm an I'm a AKA, oh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a black American. If you're gonna do all these things and self, set yourself apart in that way, then you have to set yourself apart by having a black agenda. So the whole birtherism Can you conspiracy- just take a step back what, and, and say what? And talk a little bit about Kamala's background. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Kamala is, her mother is Indian. Indian, an Indian immigrant to the United States. I, I, you know, if, I believe she was born outside of the United States mm -hmm. and immigrated to uh, the California er area to go to school and then, you know, be a professor at mm -hmm. Berkeley. Um, and so her mother is an Indian immigrant and her father is a Jamaican immigrant. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about taking on the persona of being an African American, African American is a very specific term. It means a black person in America who cannot trace their roots back to a specific country in America. It was a term that kind of came about in the 60s and 70s, uh, mostly uh, propagated by Jesse Jackson as a way to describe a specific group of people, black people in America who could not trace their roots back to a specific country in Africa. So to call yourself, if, if Kamala calls herself African-American, that is that is a lie. Um, but that's not the point of what what I as a ADOS person, even as a black person in America expect from a candidate like Kamala Harris, mm -hmm. I, expe I expect an agenda uh, from her that is go going to close the racial wealth gap, that is going to benefit the least prosperous among us. And time after time, that has been ADOS, American descendants of slavery in America. And so when I, open Twitter, open CNN, open Elaine, and see that, and see candidates saying that this birtherism movement targeted at Kamala is bull, bull crap, bullshit, then I get offended by that because I know that there is, there, from my perspective, there isn't a birtherism movement. There's, there's a movement to hold um, mm -hmm. folks accountable for presenting a black agenda, uh, ADO's agenda, because by 2053, AOS people in America will have a collective value of zero wealth, and that's just unsustainable. When you have zero wealth, when you have to live paycheck to paycheck, when you have to depend on government programs, when you cannot provide for your children, uh, provide childcare, provide a decent education, provide transportation, provide all these things that mean that mean that you're living the American life, not even the American dream. You're just living a basic American life. Like you go to K through 12 education, play sports, you get a job, you go to college. All that is basic American life. And if we as ADOS people being here for 400 years now can't, can't even achieve that basic standard of American citizenship, then there's something wrong. So I, I, I have a problem with uh, this uh, ability, this, this movement to hold presidential account, uh, candidates accountable for having a black agenda um, demeaning because I know as an ADOS person, that's what I'm doing. And I think it speaks larger, more largely to the whole concept that ADOS people are demanding reparations. We cannot continue, like you mentioned, we cannot continue, we cannot continue to survive as an ethnic group, which is what ADOS people are. We're an ethnic, an individual ethnic group with distinct cultural, um, lineage-based, race-based 
distinction from other groups. So I, I so I think if if uh, so, what's the lineage that you're talking about? The lineage I'm talking about is a uh, like how who are ADOS? You are ADOS if you have a ancestor who was an African enslaved in the United States of America or yeah. what became the United States of America. And so a lot of what the mainstream media has done is said people who assume this identity, um, a newly resurrected identity, really a newly created identity, born out of uh, two activists, two, uh, one is a lawyer, Antonio Moore out of Los yeah. Angeles, and one is a former Democratic staffer um, who lives in Atlanta, Yvette Carnell, born out of those two people talking about, mm. you know, American descendants of slavery are a distinct people. And so we have a distinct claim yeah. and a distinct um, need from politicians. That all being said, to claim that this group of people, which I claim to be a part of, which I know I'm a part of, are birthers is really disrespectful. So Macy Marina has been claiming that mm -hmm. American descendants of slavery are birthers for holding Kamala account of, account of, accountable or we're Russian bots who are yeah. being influenced by the Russian government yeah. to encourage Division. black people yeah. not to vote, mm -hmm. uh, which harkens back to kind of what happened in the 2016 election where there was this campaign, proven or not proven so far, that there was Russian interference um, online, on social media to get folks to either not vote for Hillary or vote for, vote for Donald Trump because, for, by whatever means. Because ADOS are like, if there's no black agenda, we won't vote. If there's right? no black agenda, we won't vote. Don't call us mm -hmm. bots. Don't call us birthers. We, just like any other group, and I'm, I'm gay, so mm -hmm. I, I want an equal rights amendment that protects gay people. Um, you're an immigrant to this country, so I want there to be legislation that provides protection for immigrants, provides a path to come to America for immigrants. I want all those things. But I also know that despite popular belief, I've worked my ass off. Mm -hmm. I have a, you know, I went to one of the best schools in the nation. I served in the army for six years. I have two master's degrees. And like you said, I still have to make ends meet and try to invest and save what I have so that my kids have a better life. And so it's not simply, it's not good enough to say work hard and pull yourself uh, up by your bootstraps when there has been bootstraps and there has been systematic racism and systematic oppression against American descendants of slavery yeah. throughout the history of the United States. And so that kind of brings us to the point of the video about reparations, yes. really. And so... And the importance of reparations right now. I gave that statistic earlier that by 2053, American descendants of slavery, the black people in America who are descended from slaves and descended from slave owners, that unique group, were, you know, we, I did my 21 and me, 21 and me? 23. 20, 23, hell, 20, <laughs> we have 23 chromosomes, don't we? Keep going. Okay, uh, so I did the 23 and me thing, and I'm, what, 13% Irish, British? Yeah. And so I'm, I'm very, I understand that for that reason, A to us people are a unique group. I descend from slaves and slave owners. And, and indigenous so, people. And indigenous yeah. people. Yeah, I got to live in indigenous too, a little native mm -hmm. blood. So for all those reasons, there is a specific claim and a specific lineage and a specific class and a specific culture that I have, that I grew up with, that I maintain. And after living my life, I now understand that... Mm. There is no a answer for the pro for ADOS people prospering in the United States without re without reparations, so, without a reparations okay. claim. What is, we have we have to have what reparations. Is reparations then. So reparations, basically, I mean, if you break down the words, it's a repair for a wrong. You're righting a wrong that was committed against the people. And so when we talk about American descendants of slavery, we go we have to go all the way back to 1619. First slave, enslaved Africans came to America. And then the 200 years of slavery, that 250 years of slavery that followed. And then the promise after the end of slavery post-Civil War by General Sherman, 1865, that guaranteed newly freed slaves um, 40 acres and a mule. Basically, 
40 acres was considered what a family needed to maintain a farm, uh, maintain a farm and to prosper in mid 19th century America. So mm -hmm. General Sherman, Union General said, by, by field order, I believe it's field order 15, by field order 15, I declare that newly freed slaves will be given 40 acres and a mule as reparations following their free, following uh, being freed and following the Civil War. Unfortunately, that never happened. And the folks who were the, the formerly in, uh, enslaved people that were given the 40 acres and a mule quickly had it taken back and they were evicted from their land. Um, after Abraham Lincoln died, you know, we, he didn't survive long. He got shot. Bam, John Booth took him out in the theater. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Johnson became president. Andrew Johnson wasn't happening. This is the same man, basically, who marched Native Americans off their land and into these uh, reservations that they, kind of, they live on now. I mean, they, they were trailers. That's, mm -hmm. that, that's that guy. Yeah. He also said that, you know what? I will give the land back and I will pardon and excuse and uh, provide amnesty to any Southerners, any civil rights or civil rights, civil war soldiers who pledge an oath of allegiance. So all this land that we promised the freed slaves, we're going to take it back. Me, Andrew Johnson, me, Andrew Johnson, President Andrew Johnson, I'm going to take it back in favor of an oath of allegiance from these white former slave owners, despite them being traitors who fought for the Civil War, instead of fulfilling the promise of giving free slaves 40 acres and a mule, I'm going to go back on that promise and give former white slave honor owners their land back instead of this 40 acres and a mule. Mm -hmm. And so within a generation, you basically see the white slave owners who had to forfeit their land regain all the wealth mm -hmm. and status they had. It doesn't take long to regain wealth and status when you have the social connections and that goes into the social capital when you have you know millions of newly freed slaves mm -hmm. um no access to capital no resources no inheritance and then you say not a generation later we're going to give the white the children of these white slave on owners their land back which has value we're going to give them their resources back which have value we're going to give them money back for them having to forfeit slaves which has value, then you're automatically creating a system that mm -hmm. is in balance. And so not a, when you have you know, millions of freed slaves who no land, no resources, no yeah. opportunities, the only option was we see most formerly enslaved people become share, sharecroppers, which mm -hmm. is you know, slavery in another fo uh, form. Um, and basically a sharecropper is someone who says, I will plow this land. I will I will sow the seed. I will plow the land. I will take care of this farm in exchange for the ability to live here. And once I or I will live here and I will keep 80%, 50%, 30%, 20% of the crop and I'll give you the remaining back as rent as um I guess uh a thank you for letting me plow this land. And so you get formerly enslaved people in this in this sharecropper relationship where they're working the land of former white slave owners, or you get black folks who are arrested for not having a job, arrest, which is totally ridiculous. How are you going to get arrested for not having a job? Of course, you're a former slave. They don't want you to have a job. So you get arrested for not having a job. You get arrested for petty crimes that you, you, didn't, you didn't commit. And so you become a convict who is leased out to former slave owners to sow, till, see their leasing. land. Convict leasing, okay. exactly. It's convict leasing. So post-Civil War, you have the promise of 40 acres and a mule rescinded. You have formerly incarcerated or formerly enslaved people who are basically forced to either become sharecroppers or are leased as convicts who are, are put into a system where any minor infraction gets you six, seven years, and the only way to get out is to provide mm -hmm. money or a promise, which recently enslaved people don't have. Or in, in many cases, which kind of leads to the next part of this, you have groups of black people who decide to branch out, start their own towns, and it's wildly successful. Yeah. Wildly successful. You get you get places like 
Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You have places like Rosewood, Florida, all black towns, many all black towns on the southeast coast through Georgia, and North Carolina, still, South Carolina, Florida. They and they're still, today. they're mm -hmm. still mostly black places yeah. today. Like South Carolina is mo mostly black people, Georgia, Florida. All these are, uh, have large black populations because post-Civil War, post-emancipation, mm -hmm. black people settled together. Mm. Even with those prosperous towns, you see this influx of racial violence. You start to prosper, you start to get a little money, mm. you start to get a little resources, you start to get influence. You start to elect like, senators and representatives. Black senators and black representatives, formerly enslaved people, mm -hmm. formerly, formerly former sharecroppers, former you know, folks who were who were incarcerated post-Civil War. You start seeing these people. You know, I got to I got to see my own horn here. Black ADOS people are resilient people. So despite mm -hmm. all of that, you see these big prosperous towns pop, uh, pop up and white folks can't take it. They mm -hmm. cannot take it. And so summer of 1919, summer of 1919, which hitting the 100 year anniversary of, mm -hmm. mind you, um, black veterans coming back from World War One. They have a little bit of money in their pocket. They have access to resources that they didn't have before and you know a lot of white racists lose their mind and you get the sum the bloody summer of 1919 right. violence in chicago a lot of towns in the southeast mm -hmm. northeast where racial what we call a race riot i don't think that's the right way to describe no, it it is not. domestic terror white domestic terrorism leveled against the black population in america at that point and it basically goes unchecked so let's take it back you got post-slavery um, a reparations pro promise rescinded, convict leasing, um, mm -hmm. sharecropping, racial violence, KKK. This is the this is the heyday of the KKK. The hey, hey, heyday of KKK is 1910s, 1920s. They're running rampant throughout the South, throughout the North. I mean, one of the one of the primary locations of Ku Klux Klan is is the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. So you have. The concentration of white terrorists, white domestic terrorists, white racists saying that the political power, the social power, the social capital, economic power that black folks in America are gaining is intolerable. And you see this constant oppression, systemic, individual, institutional levied against black people. So not only do we not get that 40 acres and a mule, not only were was the citizenship that was guaranteed the full citizenship that was guaranteed to aid mm -hmm. people not not provided or protected by the US government, but you see a deliberate attempt um both through physical violence and through uh disintegration and uh reluctance really to protect the civil rights, the the rights of black people as citizens in America. And all that, I won't go into too much further because it's it's more recent history, but you know, following that era of racial violence in the 1910s and 20s, you get separate but equal, mm -hmm. where you know black kids in schools aren't getting the same education as white kids, despite them having the protections of full citizenship, being made full citizens. You get um, the introduction of crack co cocaine to black communities where we see a distinct disparity in the sentencing of folks, mostly white people who are found to be uh, have cocaine related drug violations and a much more intense and punitive sentencing of black folks who are found to have crack related yeah. convictions. So not only do you have the drugs being introduced to the black community but have this dispar these disparities in sentencing, in, 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 yeah. in sentencing but you have a suppression of voter rights that is stood till today redlining um a new mass incarceration that was legislated for and lobbied for wow. by uncle joe as folks like to call him uncle joe biden Fuck you, joe. and so this isn't ancient history this isn't history that each and every living american is not a part of yeah. despite s slavery having been over for over what I mean, you know my math's not good 150 years yes. the legacy of slavery the oppression the denial of full citizenship the segregation the 
racism has continued. Slavery, convict leasing, and being locked out uh, of black the housing codes, market, Jim Crow, redlining, allowed, mass incarceration, yeah. uh, school to prison pri pipeline. Reparations are not only owed for slavery to American descendants of slavery, but it's owed for the oppression and racism and denying denial of full citizenship that has occurred since. It's, yeah, it's all those things. So white people's response is generally like, I didn't own slaves and neither did my family, so I'm never going to pay. And that's just not it, right? That's because not it the because claim the claim has not, did not stop, does yeah. not stop at slavery. Mm -hmm. The claim continues. I could, you know, if, if I was a legal mind, I would make a claim, you know, I got too many things going on, but I could make a legal claim today against racism and oppression, systemic institutional individual against the U.S. government. I can still make that claim. And that's that's the kind of the thing is the reparations claim for American descendants of slavery is intentionally specific not to exclude people, not to exclude certain groups uh, because of xenophobia or a nativist idea, but legal claims for reparations have to be specific. Any legal claim has to be specific. Like I can't go to, um, let's, what's a company I've, I've never used? I can't go to AOL and say, um, I'm suing you because you didn't, you didn't give me a job and be that, be that. I've never applied for a job at AOL. So I don't have a legal claim against them not hiring me if I never had the opportunity to be discriminated against. If I never had the opportunity to be oppressed, like if they, if I applied for a job and they said, we're not gonna hire you because you're black, we're not gonna hire you because you're a woman, we're not gonna hire you because because this, that, and the other, then then I have a specific claim. I can't just levy a specific claim that I never- Yeah, I wanna rewind a little yeah. because there is a critique of ADOS that the movement is xenophobic and homophobic, um, especially xenophobic because- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of the exclusion of- Yeah, African I mean- I, it's 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 the legal system it's the legal system throughout the world that a legal in a legal claim you have to have standing right. and for american descendants of slavery our claim is the is against the u.s government as of now there's many claims against corporations that benefit from slavery against individuals for, that benefit from slavery right now the claim is against the u.s government because the u.s government legalized and perpetuated the institution of slavery against American descendants of slavery. And then they continued after the ab abolition of slavery and after the making of black people as full citizens to sanction and legally allow discrimination and oppression. For folks out, for, for black people who were enslaved outside of the United States, I fully support a legal claim right. against Britain Mm -hmm. For folks in the Caribbean, I support a legal claim against France. For folks in places like Haiti, I support a legal reparations claim for folks in South America against places like Portugal and Spain and all and those all those even, countries who even there are even claims in Afri in African countries against the Dutch and the and the Spanish and the English. Those claims have to be specific and have standing to work. I support legal reparations claims against all those nations for the specific people and the for specific descendants mm -hmm. impacted by that colonizer mindset and by the institution of slavery in those countries. So again, right. for Africans who were Africans and their descendants who were enslaved in Haiti, mm -hmm. I support every claim to against the French government to demand reparations every second of the day yeah and there's other groups too like we you weren't with me but i was at the chinese park in tacoma mm -hmm. where you know chinese folks were expelled from tacoma um and maybe there's a reparations claim there but the the like i'm not claiming reparations as like a chinese person who lives in seattle like it's it's a separate and distinct claim and identity and i think people people's minds get a little like boggled and triggered. They get, they get defensive when you right. hear that the AOS reparations movement is for, and so this, I'll go into the, like the qualifications for. But I also wanted to make one more point. Okay. It's just that this is, this is an intergenerational thing. Like, can you prove that the Chinese people 
expelled from Tacoma have faced like intergenerational violence, poverty, mass incarceration, and that there's a a wealth gap there. A it's just, it's the same gap. thing with the gay with you know I, I saw this article recently about should gay people in America get reparations. You know, aside from. You, like you said, has there been an intergenerational right. diminishment? Has there been an intergenerational loss among LGBTQ people due to regulations and policy of the U.S. government? I don't know if that's the case. Are there individual claims? For sure. There are you know, mm-hmm. hundreds, if not thousands, of LGBT, LGBTQ folks who were discharged from the military under yeah. don't ask don't tell who have a claim against the u.s government mm-hmm. and the u.s military to say you need to reinstate me as a military member with an honorable discharge mm-hmm. and i might even say you need to pay me back the paycheck i would have gotten had i not been kicked out that is not the same as what we're saying for a to us no. is it a group claim it is not it's an individual very recent claim that some folks might have against the U.S. military, don't ask, don't tell the U.S. government. But I'll say that all that again to say these claims have to be very specific and that the LGBT community as a whole can't claim, can't sue the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. It has to be a specific claim from these specific people who were specifically impacted by the policy. So that brings us to who qualifies. I told you like, as a part of this ADOS reparations movement, the scholars like um, Sandy Darity, Duke, uh, Professor Ida Duke, has has qualified the what it takes to to qualify for these reparations, and I think it makes sense. One, you have to be able to trace your lineage back to a person who was enslaved, mm-hmm. um, an African person who was enslaved in America. So for me, mm-hmm. I would have to trace. I would have to find an ancestor in my lineage who was enslaved in america and, and then, that be hard for you no because i can already trace my lineage mm-hmm. with with a with a free google search in the 1870 right. uh 18 maybe 1890 census records yeah. i can already tra- trace my lineage back to the 1800s yeah so, so no yeah. it, it is and not difficult i've been 23 and me and yeah, like yeah this, my great grandmother yeah, was yes enslaved. we mm-hmm. this is the thing about you know black folks in america aside from the great migration black my family has not moved much mm-hmm. our roots of it are most of my family is in louisiana and they were probably enslaved mm-hmm. in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. And so I'll say, one, you gotta be able to trace your ancestry back to an enslaved person. Two, you have to have identified as a black person for the last 10 years. So even if you can trace your lineage back right. to an enslaved person, you can't just pop up and say, oh, oh, uh, uh, I know I've identified as, as white for, the, for my mm-hmm. life, but I wanna get on in this reparations check so I'm black all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't work like that. Like you have to have assumed the life of a black person, lived as a black mm-hmm. person, had oppression and systemic racism leveled against you as a black by identifying I, and being black by yes. identifying mm-hmm. and being being black exactly so it's it's not enough to just to have the, mm-hmm. the ancestor it's not enough just to identify as black which would exclude a lot of immigrants who don't have the legal right. claim a lot of foreign born black people who don't have a legal legal mm-hmm. claim so it's those two things yeah it's those t- two things that would, that would uh, make you qualify mm-hmm. that, would, that would qualify you and so we had this question um from one of our audience members and okay. their question is what is the outcome what is the end state you know what does it look like the outcome is simple to me mm-hmm. when i look at the data and i see that the average a to os a d o s it's, it's kind of blends together ados a d o s family in america has seventeen hundred dollars to their name that does include depreciating assets mm-hmm. like clothing and in a car, seventeen hundred dollars is not enough money to live in America. Couple that with the fact that by twenty fifty three, I said a statistic at the beginning, that the average ADOS family will have zero dollars in wealth. Mm. And so, when we talk about what does the outcome look like, it looks like a full repair uh, for the crimes and the sins mm-hmm. that have continued since slavery. So. When you declare that I'm going to give you 40, 40 acres and a mule, what is 40 acres and a mule today? What is 40 acres and a mule in land? What is it in cash? So I think it is ca- cash reparations, mm-hmm. w- which would make an immediate impact on closing the racial wealth gap, yeah. which sees, again, black folks with an average net worth of $1,700 and white families with an mm-hmm. average net worth of 
over a hundred thousand. So cash is is an immediate fix, mm -hmm. but it also has to include free access to college, so education, possibly tax exempt status, housing vouchers, small business loans. Mm -hmm. When being black and being ADOS in America has impacted every part of your life, mm -hmm. when it has impacted your ability to get a home loan, small business yeah. loan, when has it impacted your ability to pay for college, when it has impacted your ability to afford childcare, then any remedy has to also take into account all those things. So mm -hmm. I need to see free childcare. And these aren't handouts, this is a debt. This is a debt. When people say, well, why are you begging for a handout? I don't, I don't, that, that's not the case. If your great grandpa mm. worked 40 years and he never saw a single paycheck, would you call the check that he finally got for all his hard work a handout? Or would you call that a debt that was due? Would you mm -hmm. call that an inheritance? Would you call that what was owed to your family? It's what is owed to you. Mm -hmm. So reparations are not a handout. It's a debt that is due. At this time, we're asking for from the U.S. government. Eventually, I want to see it from major corporations that have benefit from slavery. Yeah. Washington, D.C., built by slaves. Philadelphia, built by slaves. Cities like Atlanta, built by slaves. The city yeah. that I came for, from, Shreveport, Louisiana, used to be the capital of the Confederacy at one point. And so, in a place like Shreveport now that is over 50% black people, I want to see a black mayor. I want to see black city council. I want to see black people finally get the political power, economic power, social capital that comes with being a full citizen in America. So yeah. reparations is all those things. It's not just cash. It is cash, but it is cash. It's not just programming, social programs like vouchers, housing, childcare, education, but it is those things also. And it's not just loans and access to capital, but it is also loans and access to mm -hmm. capital. It's all those things. It's not just one or the other. Again, I'll say this, when being black and being a descendant of slavery has affected every part of your existence in a place like America, then I want to see full repair in every aspect of my life. Yeah, and especially in Seattle, people bang on about racial equity the whole time. Black and, Lives Matter signs in the yard. In their $1.5 million Race and house. equity okay, initiatives. Okay, and so reparations is equity, right? Because you're giving black descendants of slavery exactly what they need to thrive and to even become equal to white people in this to country. To assume what it means to be American. Like, you're not giving them everything that they need to be above white people. Like, that's the thing. Or to even be above African people. Born, born blacks, yeah. So, it's... So, I really think that Seattle people, in particular, need to be understanding reparations, need to be... Adding it to their toolkit. You gotta of, understand race specific policy. Yeah. Saying that I'm gonna provide housing vouchers to every family making under $100,000, that's not gonna it? close um, the racial wealth the gap. Basic, uh, Universal income, basic yeah. income, that's not gonna it's close the racial wealth it. gap. It's that's not, not gonna, that's not gonna pull black folks out of poverty, especially when you have a housing system in which the majority of land is owned by white folks. What, yeah. what, how does it benefit black people? to put more money into the pockets of white folks. That doesn't make sense. Well, especially when black people are what percentage of the population and... In the United States? 13, yeah. 13 to 15%? So, so? It's, yeah, it's just not going to... So the point is targeted specific policies that are um, tailored for this population in particular. Yeah, I mean, but that's like... ADOS, reparations, this false birther movement against Kamala, and I all think, into one. And it will continue as, as well, we got 18 months before the election. Yeah. A big, a big part of my, my understanding and my focus on this upcoming election will be mm -hmm. what can candidates do for my community? Right. What, 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 I can't give my vote away without at least a pledge or a policy from from the candidate I'm voting for that says I'm going to help take care of your family, meaning my black kids. Like, I, I need to make uh, sure... Marianne Williamson. Yeah, uh. she, I mean, she's got a little reparations package. I think it needs to be bigger. It needs yeah. to be bigger, but she's 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 at least spoken about um, reparations in a full-throated way and said that I yeah. support a reparations movement. Although I don't know if she's said cash payments, individual cash well, payments, yeah, which no, is an important part of it. I don't it. think... Any Anyone candidate has. I mean, Elizabeth Warren has said that a few bill, billion to HBCU. Yeah, I need um, I need individual cash payments as a, as an important part of it. Um, All these are buzzwords. HBCUs and Black maternal health. Literally, every candidate will say, "I'm gonna 
I'm gonna fight for black maternal health, which is important, but what about the children? What about the black men? It's every part of the black well, community. Well, it's like, yeah, so black men, women will be able to give birth without dying or almost dying, but then what happens to the kid afterwards? Like, And when, he's, when he or she is born into a system that mm -hmm. Um, legally or illegally discriminates against from birth and even from in the birth womb. from birth from the womb until death against eighty eighty US people. Yeah, I said this in my stories, but um, at a work meeting the other day, folks were talk um legislative advocates were talking about um having to protect little black boys in pre K through legislation being enacted in Washington state because of the disproportionate number of expulsions that are being um, made against little black boys in pre-K. So that's a prime example of a systemic issue. Um, but do you have anything else to no, add? That's before it. We I, I'm going to have a lot to say. This is election yeah, gets closer. This is just the and first, the, but the election isn't it. The it doesn't end at the election. Yeah. It's just an important yeah. part of this election. Don't don't buy the birther movement against Kamala. There's no birther movement. We're just trying to hold politicians accountable for helping the least prosperous among us. And that's yep. ADOS people. And, and follow, it's been for 400 years. Follow Joy on Twitter. Yeah, um, um, I'll Joy get, at... I'll put it yeah, on do the that. screen. Um, she posts all the time. I about reparations all the time. time. Yeah, about reparations. Check out the about hashtag ADOS on Twitter. Um... What else can they do? We'll be making more videos. Support about reparations this. movement. Yeah. Get your candidate, your representatives, especially mm -hmm. in the U.S., to uh, support HR 40, which is the current legislation to study um, reparations for American descendants of slavery. So that's the first step. Mm -hmm. HR 40. It needs revisions, but it's the first step. Support. Demand that candidates, political candidates, have a black agenda. And I'll put some info. Um, below in the descriptions of this video um to resources and joy's twitter handle and all the things bam that's okay. all she wrote see ya